What is going on, comic fam? It's your boy, the Bearded Comic Bro, and I am joined by comic creator Lori Calcaterra. Welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. You, you just finished up a Kickstarter for your third book, Path of the Pale Rider. Um, we're going to talk about how people can still get in on that if they haven't gotten it. But before we mm -hmm. hop into your book and the, all the stuff that you got going on, I always like to know, how did you get into comics? Have you always like had a love for comics, or is this just something that like you kind of fell into later? Um, I have kind of a weird story and it actually starts when I started training martial arts in 1997. So I, I've been practicing Filipino and Indonesian martial arts, um, since 1997. And, uh, I've been kind of a lifelong practitioner and I've met a lot of people doing a lot of networking and got into, um, stunts and, uh, choreographing fights in about 2017. So I had a team I was, uh, managing, um, that's where Trinity 60 came from. That's my business. So we were like, teach people how to fall down without getting hurt and like, uh, filling in for stunts and, and, you know, pulling from different arts, just depending on what production was looking for. Did they want jujitsu? Did they want Muay Thai? Did they want a knife fight? And we kind of filled in the blanks for what they were looking for. Um, I wrote a short film kind of as our, like our resume. So it had like a wall run and an extended knife fight and I ran someone over with a car. I mean, we did some crazy stuff. Um, and the production company liked me so much. They asked me to continue writing web content for their channel. Uh, so I, I started some series there. I wrote one called the agency, which started production, but didn't get, didn't go anywhere. Okay. Uh, but that's where I got the writing bug and wrote my, my concept. So what would happen if death got broken and that turned into Path of the Pill Rider. And then I kind of like just completely stalled, had no idea what to do with it. But in the meantime, uh, my husband and I have been reading comics uh, separately. Like he's been reading a lot of DC comics. He's a big Batman fan. Um, I read some Batman, but I, I was probably in my 20s when I started reading like The Watchmen, yep. uh, Walking Dead, and a lot of like image comics, Saga, East of West, Invincible, yep. blah, 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 right? Um, so when I wrote this script and I didn't know what to do with it, my husband read it and he was like, this is a comic book. And kind of like, ding, the light bulb went off, right? We were like, yeah, it is. So then it became a matter of, how do I do that? Right. That's that's <laughs> awesome. Having, like, I feel like, I feel like I'd be best friends with your husband because you said Batman. I'm like, I'm a huge Batman fan. Yeah. So, um, and, but then he got you, encouraged you to write a comic. So where did it go from there then? Uh, we had to take the, the script. It was a full length movie. And break it up into issues. And I, I spent probably two years working on the script, um, making it what it is before I even got an artist involved. And of course, when did I decide to do all this? Beginning of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible timing. Um, and I had a couple artists involved. I had one involved. Um, the pandemic started. I got another one involved to kind of help with the first one. Both of them ultimately ended up leaving the project. And I was lord but you know um now that i've been doing this for a while it's like it's very common for that to happen yeah. uh more common than i i knew of uh where an artist gets involved and maybe bit off more than they can chew or things you know there's isn't enough time in the day to do everything it right. just stuff happens right and um i'm still friends with both of these guys we're still close and they still do like variant covers and and interiors of other things. So we didn't burn any bridges. It's just the pandemic happened. Right. Um, I took a year off and I was like, do I really want to do this thing? Uh, I had second thoughts whether I was going to continue or not. And then um, beginning of, it was January, 2022. I met Marco DeFillo on Facebook in a group called Connecting Comic Book Writers and Artists. Mm. I mean, if you're looking for somebody, that's the place to go, right? Yeah, apparently it's, <laughs> it's, and, it's um, the match. It's the match.com for creators. <laughs> pretty much. But it was a great place because it's very straightforward where it's like, Hey, this is what I'm looking for. This is the style I'm looking for. People can upload their um, portfolios. Um, you can talk about page rates. Everybody is uh, it's pretty business. You know, it's not any kind of fluff or, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's right to the point, but um I was lucky that I found Marco. One, he's in Texas where I am. We're only like an hour apart, which is really cool um, because we can do like cons together and yeah. like we go to comic book shops together. 
Um, we had lunch together to sign a bunch of issue number twos to ship out. Um, so that works out in our favor that we're in proximity. But his style, uh, what got me was he was already working on another project called Malka, which was an apocalypse story based in Hawaii. Um, really interesting. And I love kind of like um, the style that he has, the coloring that he can do, and of course, the level of gore that he brings because we're pretty gory. We're in apocalypse when we got like undead things, right? Right. So um, I wanted to make sure that he could handle everything that I'm going to throw at him with this story, but no problem. Right. <laughs> it's just fine. Yeah. So the story. Um, yes. If people haven't gotten to check out the first two issues from the previous Kickstarters, and I know, like I said, you just wrapped up the third. What is, what's the elevator pitch for this story? What's it about? I, okay. Path of the Pill Rider is a world where death has been broken. So what that means is your body can die, but your soul or your energy doesn't leave your body upon death. So you're still you stuck in your body as it's decaying. And this goes for people, animals, insects, fish, nothing gets to leave anymore. Um, so people, the undead are modeled more after um, people with uh, brain disorder, like uh, dementia, cognitive decay, that kind of thing. But they're still them, right? They're not trying to eat you. It's you, it's me, it's mom, it's your neighbor. Um, but they're becoming more chaotic. They get forgetful. They become detached. They become violent. Um, just because as the brain decays, these are, this is the natural progression yeah. of humans. Um, so now we have this large population of people that are dangerous. So what happens to the world as we have famine? Because it's a lot harder to eat meat. Uh, the animals don't want to be butchered because they are also undead. Um, nor do I want to eat a hamburger that is still moving when I try to eat it. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we have insects that are eating crops because pesticides don't work. So we have we have all sorts of infrastructure, overpopulation, famine, um, you know, it's its a really tough place to navigate. And then we start bringing in like the human element of uh, taking away rights of the undead. Like, you know, how long do they get to drive a car or own property or, you know, vote or, or you know, all those things that typically go away when you die. Um, so that's kind of the background of the world. So when we start issue one, we're 10 years into that apocalypse and we're following this cowboy named Jude St. Clair, who's like the last guy still looking for the answer, what broke death, right? Everybody else has kind of moved on, um, yeah. to just trying to scrape by and um, he's looking for something or somebody. He has a, a, a path and uh, he'll do anything to figure it out. So issue one, he's kind of in the wild. You get to see him make decisions and how even small decisions have dire consequences. And then issue number two, he goes into a town called Santa Claus, which I think is hilarious. Um, it's a real place in Arizona. People are telling me that there's a uh, Santa Claus, Illinois as well. So, but and, and I think there's one in Indiana. Indiana? Indiana? So, yeah. Yeah, okay, so, it's Indiana, not Illinois. Okay, okay. So yeah, yeah because yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. So yeah. It's place, that's right? Yeah. So <laughs> it's a really funny moment in the first issue. When he's talking to somebody and they're like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm looking for Santa Claus. And they're like, aren't you a little old for that? <laughs> and he's like, not the legend. I'm looking for the town of Santa Claus. You know, and they're like, well, there's no names left anymore. Everything has just gone to dust. But there's a town up the bluff, you know. Um, but he makes it to Santa Claus and uh, finds what he's looking for. But it's not what he was expecting. And um, kind of the aftermath of what happens and how those people... They're, they're not nice. Let's just say that. They're not nice to him or anybody in this yeah. town. So it's a rough place. Um, issue number three, which we just funded on Kickstarter. I'm so excited. Which is awesome. Uh, Congrats. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And um, this one is different. So the last two, we've been in the apocalypse in the present. And now we're taking a time jump back to day one of the apocalypse where death went missing. So now you get to see firsthand Jude St. Clair uh, deal with undead people, um, the chaos, uh, and how quickly things just fall apart. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I'm I'm excited. I, it's 
it's funny um you know you sent me some stuff to you know check it out yeah. on the on the press releases and things and i went straight to reading the comics before i read any press releases and so i was like okay i i have an idea where this is going and then there was a part at like issue two where i go oh i have no idea where this was going i was like <laughs> okay i was like i did not realize it like oh i'm like i'm i'm totally here for that idea so i gotta ask then of <laughs> Where did this idea originate for you? I know you said it kind of started with your rhyme, but like, how did this yeah. idea, like, this is a story I want to tell. Yeah. Um, well, it was just the idea of what would happen if death changed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. We, we we have, I, I'm a big horror fan. I love zombie genre. Um, I do stuff like zombie runs and, you know, it's like over the summer where people are running. And I, I'm the one that volunteers to dress up as the zombie and try to tackle them as they're running their 5K. <laughs> So um, I love all that stuff. So I was like, how can we take the zombie genre, but update it and make it yeah. more human, right? Yeah. So if we changed how death works and we changed it fundamentally for everything, what would that look like? You know, and, and when I was writing this story, I really spent a lot of time building the world first, mm -hmm. making sure I had all the rules. But like, it was really interesting to think about all the different things that would happen if death changed. Yeah. Like how we eat, you know, how our rights work. What would the government do? You know, how would society react? It would change relationships. Um, it would change. In, it, um, well, one of the covers from my issue number three uh, was a not suitable for work cover. Okay. And people are like, why? And I was like, I wanted to bring up the subject of intimacy and taboos. Yeah. Because that would would change fundamentally, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you, they're still them for a while. So is it okay? <laughs> right. And how yeah. long is it okay for, you know? Yeah. Wow. It's, so, how, so like deep. how much when you, with this idea and as you start like, okay, I have this kind of point where I want to take this of death, not dying, you know, yes. like how much research then was it for you of like rabbit holes? Did you fall down? I'm going, well, if this doesn't happen, then this doesn't happen and this and right. Like morticians, are they a thing anymore? <laughs> right. Probably because here's the thing. Um, the undead are going to start to decay very fast. And at what point are we going to say like, how do we slow that down so the people can stay with us longer? Mm. Right. So yeah. are we combining embalming techniques with makeup or like to, to try and save the undead so they can appear more human for longer? Or are they trying to pass as humans so that way they're not carted off to some place like an undead retirement community, right? Because at some point, are they being separated from living and dead? And then um, we actually built some technology based in the world. So there's this thing, you can see my shirt, I have this emblem, this circle with the, the heart line, right? Yep. So they wear these um, devices called a disc. So once the government's kind of like, okay, once you lose your heartbeat, you are classified undead. You become this new category. It doesn't matter if you can remember your name or not. You're separate. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. they, it's like their new driver's license, right? You have to wear it. They can, government can like come and tap your disc to make sure you still have a heartbeat. And then they kind of classify you based off of your, you know, your living status. However, it's technology, right? We can hack it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they're hacking discs or disc malfunction and it causes all sorts of problems. So um we went down a lot of rabbit holes, a lot. Um we have religion, we have conspiracy theories built into this world. Um we have all sorts of different types of communities based on the belief system of what happened. Uh you're gonna see a whole lot of things. So we're still in the pretty early stages yeah. of the story. You're going to see all sorts of stuff. But the cool thing is about this is that there's the comic book, but we also have other medium that you can, yeah. you know, experience Path of the Pale Rider. So you could read the comic book. On the back of every issue is a, a riddle. So, so I have an issue of number two with me. And um, here's the riddle on the back. So one of the things that my character does is he utilizes American Sign Language. So in on the back of this issue, there is a riddle written in American Sign Language. So the first thing you have to do is translate the riddle, and then you have to solve the riddle. And then that triggers something to show up at your house uh, from one of my characters. 
So you can solve the riddles and interact with the world. We have um, ooh, some of the things I have planned. Phone numbers to call uh, that will, they will have something that you can interact with. Uh, websites to hack. Um, secret YouTube videos. Uh, we're working on doing like an old timey radio show where it's like a, a cop buddy show. And um, it's it's a dark humor. I, I have a co-writer for that one. I'm excited. So that one's in the works. Um, we got a lot of different things and some things I'm not sharing because I want them to be a surprise. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's one of the things that you can do. And then on top of that, we do short films. So since I come from production, I, I can't get away from doing short films. I think they're such a cool experience. And um, I like making them fan interactive. Mm. So we'll do something different every time. And I will talk to uh, the fans in the social media groups and be like, hey, this is the topic we're tackling in this next short film. Um, this is what I need from you to do. So either if they're up to the challenge and they want to do film, they can. And they can send it to me, usually like we transfer or something like that. And I will put it in. Okay. Or if they're not comfortable speaking, a lot of times I can do, uh, like in this, uh, the third one, um, people sent me a bunch of pictures and I have like a montage of pictures that flash across the screen at the ending. Um, so there's different ways to participate, but anytime they send me something, they're guaranteed a spot in the short film. Yeah. So um, it's it's a lot of fun because that's stuff that Jude St. Clair necessarily won't see in the comic. Mm -hmm. so we're experiencing it outside of the comic so it enriches the story and i encourage people to participate so it's That's a lot cool. of fun yeah yeah so <clears throat> obviously like the movie aspect you know you like you said you you can't get away from production but like i yeah. know there was like there were songs and book like and like you said yeah. there was crosswords <laughs> and puzzles like what was it for you that you're like okay i want to do a comic book but i want to do it on like crack like i want it to be like in the, in the intense of like interactive like because like you can i think you can read it just as a comic book yes and then and be fine with it but then yeah. if you want to explore more uh and do those others like but what was it for you i was like i want to i want to do this and explore more options like that i just love a good challenge um i love stuff okay i'm a big fan of the matrix now the second two movies yeah that happened right um, but the other medium that they started producing was a big influence of what I'm doing. So like there was the Animatrix, uh, there was the computer game and the Xbox game, and those were hackable. So you could spend the time and try to figure out how to hack the Matrix just like you were in the game, right? And then they had, they had all this other stuff that you could do, um, which I really liked. The riddles came, you know, I was inspired by Neil Patrick Harris. He has a deck of cards that has um, Morse code. It has some kind of Morse code or riddle around one of the cards, which when you solve that takes it to a website. And on his website, it's like three different riddles that you have to solve. And I don't think you get anything except for bragging rights. But it was just like trying to solve the riddle or like, what's that other thing that there was a um, Cir Circada 313, okay. like riddles and, yeah. and, you know, next level of stuff. I enjoy that. I think that's so much fun. So I'm really creating something that I myself would like to consume. You know what I mean? Um, so that's really what it's about is this is the kind of stuff that I think is fun. Yeah. So put it out into the world and let's do it. I've seen interactive campaigns, you know, like on yeah. for Dark Knight did kind of an interactive campaign of like, you know, when they were doing stuff of like going to the website to see, you know, uh, vote for the mayor and stuff like this but like this is just a concept that is like no this is insanely crazy and i think it's really cool and i it allows fans to experience something differently you know reading a comic book so i yeah i'm intrigued to see like you know me now as a fan who's getting to know it a little bit more to say like okay i want to explore this a little bit more um yeah. i'm assuming you've gotten good reaction since this you know after your third kickstarter of people enjoying the interactive part yeah um, it's, it's interesting. Everybody wants to do it, but then life happens. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I kind of have to remind people about 12 times. I'm like, Hey, send me the things, you know, I'm working on the things, can you the things, you know? Yeah. Um, but people do participate. They want to participate. And as we grow, we're going to get much more participation. 
I anticipate getting so busy that I probably need to delegate things in the future. Yeah. Um, so I'll have to pick and choose which hats I wear. But right now it's kind of like I manage everything. Um, you know, I'm the writer. Uh, you know, I am I run the campaigns. I do all the advertising. I manage all the riddles, the short films, all of that. Um, at some point, I'm going to need to give somebody a hat. Yeah. <laughs> So but until that time, you're going to just Until that it. time, I have fun managing all the things. I didn't even mention this bad guy. Uh, did I send you a copy of this? Which, what is? I did uh, not. You, this no, is a I Choose don't, Your no. Own Adventure book. We we call ours Choose Your Own Path because, of course, it's Path of a Book. Naturally. Uh, this turned out really good. I did this for actually issue number two. And um, I listened to what the fans tell me. Yeah. So when I was in campaign for number one, people were like, this would be really cool as a choose your own adventure book. Done. Here it is. It's 60 pages, oh, um, wow. illustrated. Uh, it's, it's so much fun. I'm not going to spoil that one. <laughs> Here, like, where you get to put on the hat and boots and you get to go run bounties in the wasteland. That's and cool. um, you can see how long you'll survive. And what's really cool about it is you'll meet characters like the Skinner that show up later in the story. Yeah. And so you'll have insight of how terrifying some of these characters are. And um, Jude St. Clair will have no clue because he's just meeting them for the first time. So it's one of those like, oh my God, is that this? Run! <laughs> that's that's um, neat. It's that's... really fun. Yeah, I think it's more fun to lose at this book than it is to win. There is an ending. Um, and of course, there's always a riddle at the end. So... Um, I put a cipher in there. Oh, it wouldn't so be a Lori cool. Calcaterra book if there wasn't a cipher. Right. These, these are available. Uh, yeah, I think I have them on the Indiegogo that's coming. Okay, cool. So Very cool. Um, people can get one of these as well if they're interested. I think they're a lot of fun. I might do another one, but we'll that's wait. Well, what I love about, you know, just having this conversation about, uh, you know, the series so far is when you gave the elevator pitch, like, I'm like, I haven't even gotten to check out issue three yet. So like I'm at issue two. I'm like, wait, that's not oh, yeah. like something. What's you coming? Created, you created such a huge world that like, I'm, I'm hesitant. Like how much, like how expansive is this book going mm -hmm. to be? Like you're on already three issues. You're like, I'm going to do more choose your own adventure books maybe or something. Like, do you have a plan for like how many books you want to mm -hmm. do and then maybe branch out? Or like, is this just like, we're going to see where it goes? Well, the comic. All right. So when I remember I wrote this as a full length movie, so yeah, we yeah. had to break that up into it's 13 issues. Um, I kind of think about it as if it's a Netflix series okay. just because my brain, my brain is more production. So I'll, I'll mess up and I'll call them episodes instead of issues. So if it was a Netflix series, season one is 13 issues. Season two is 12. And then okay. season three will close up shop and there'll be about 12 or 13 issues, just depending on where the story takes me. Um, I think nine, I think I'm in nine issues in into season two. So I'm really far ahead, which is good because when you wear so many hats, it's like, I don't always have time to sit down and keep writing. Right. Um, but what I love about how, it, okay, season one is crazy, but the reader is getting to know the rules. The reader is getting to yep. know Jude St. Clair and kind of like how the world works and his search for what breaks death. He does figure it out in those 13 issues somewhere in towards the last act. He does figure it out. So you will, the reader will know. Um, season two is a hundred percent crazier <laughs> because now that you know how the world works and now that you know what happened, it takes a hard left turn and we start blowing shit up. <laughs> so it's a good time. It's a good time. Uh, nice. And then That's ultimately nice. that third act will end there is an ending already in place um, that's been written. So every issue that I'm I'm creating is moving us towards that ending. Okay. Nice. So yeah. if people are watching this video or listening to the interview on the podcast and they're like, this sounds like something I've got to check out. Yeah. Let's talk about where you said you're you're launching it, you know, at this time about to launch an Indiegogo. So that's where people can find it, right? Is and get this. Yeah. Um, I will be launching what I'm, I'm affectionately calling it a victory lap. Okay. So what I have learned about crowdfunding is that there's major platforms that sometimes people don't cross pollinate. Yeah. So what I mean by that is someone might be very familiar with Kickstarter 
and would never go to Indiegogo and vice versa. So the Indiegogo crowd doesn't always come to Kickstarter. Right. Um, so what I just wanted to do is to, I'm putting up a flexible goal. The book yeah. is already funded. Basically, the in making it available to the Indiegogo audience so they can also enjoy and get in on Path of the Pale Rider. Um, mm -hmm. Issues one, two, and three, physical, digital, and the Choose Your Own Adventure book are available. So nothing crazy. The book is already funded, right? Yeah. We're already going to be in production when this thing launches. So the point is just to, like, the funds will go towards either um, finishing up three, uh, starting number four, or going back and coloring some of issue one, because issue one was in black and white, and we do have intention of coloring it. So that money is just going to be funneled into the project and spent either issue one or issue four, helping us get a little bit further into the story, quicker turnaround time, lower the goals for the next Kickstarter. Uh, so yeah, so the, the book has been 100% funded by the Kickstarter, but again, that money is just going to be funneled into you know, speeding us up and helping us get further into the story. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the coloring of issue number one because I remember yeah. reading it and I was like, oh, and then issue two was right to coloring. And so Color. that just is something that you're looking at going back then uh, and yeah. having that eventually. So when you have, you know, if, it, you know, the full series or whatever, it's kind of all in color and aspect like that. You know, it's funny as time goes on and I become more savvy in the comic book world. Yeah. Um, the comics are adapting and changing. Yep. So even issue one, we're going back and we're changing some pages, starting with the reprint for issue three. So okay. like I have a quote page. Um, so the first couple prints that we did have this quote page. Uh, we're no longer going to be doing the quote page. We've changed that out to um, a journal page from Jude St. Clair's journal. So it gives more information to the reader from page one when they open the mm. comic. Um, just to give them more insight about how the world works, because without hearing my pitch and not, without understanding the world, we want the reader to be able to just buy the book at the store, open it up and be able to understand right. how the world works from page one. So there's that. Um, and then I learned about trade paperbacks. Hooray! <laughs> right? Because when you first started out, you know, creating comics, you're like, I can do that. I didn't know I could do that. So um, once we finish issue number four, Flappy, we will turn around and produce okay. a trade paperback and that's when issue one will be fully colored if not before okay yeah nice well yeah. it's it's cool like you know as you said like you've been in other aspects of media and now you're you know you're venturing into comic books and you know as you are doing this and as you're growing you're learning and you're able to adjust and make things and i think that's just a cool to say like you know i had i have had people on where they like i started with this series and it was really cool because but I can't, I'm not an artist. So I did all mm -hmm. the art for the first and now I'm retelling the story with actually an artist that doesn't look like it's a kid. Like, you know, I was like, oh, that's yeah. Cool. Like, so it's it's fun to see that, but it's also cool to see like creators, like I'm going to learn, I'm going to adapt, I'm going to grow. And then, um, and still utilize that to make what you want, you know, the best product that you want, whatever it is down the road, right? And however you want to present right. it, so. right. Yeah, I mean, it's always fluid. It's always, right. everybody is learning. And um, Marco and myself, uh, when we did issue one, we were super proud of it. And then when we finished issue two, we we're like, wow, we're way better at this, you know? So now it's like, I, I am looking forward to that same amount of growth as we yeah. go forward. When we do three, four, five, six, seven, um, eight is my favorite issue in the first kind of season. So when we get there, dude, you're good there's no turning back um everybody trust me when we get to eight it's it's life-changing that issue is like <laughs> so i'm like yeah hey, three is great four is great let's get to eight let's get there like let's just get there let's go right well, i'm again i i think this is a really cool world you built i'm excited to Thank check you. it out um I have the links to the Indiegogo when this video, um, you know, as people are watching this, they can click in the yeah. description of the video or you, but where can people follow along with you and what you're creating? And that way to just stay up to date on all things Pale Rider. Oh, I'm kind of all over the place. <laughs> um, I'm on Facebook. Um, if you search Path of the Pale Rider on Facebook, there's a group and a page. I recommend um, joining the group. 
that's where we do shenanigans. That's where I give my like my big updates, all the um, what we're looking for for the short films. We play games. We do all sorts of fun stuff. We made a playlist of music for the apocalypse. We uh, I challenge people to like go to images and Google and like type in your name plus apocalypse where and like post the picture. That show. They're super funny. Um, I want to revisit that because we got lots of new members. I think we should that's do it cool. again. Um, but that's where our kind of like home base is. Yep. But of course, we're on Instagram. Um, it's at Path of the Pill Rider with an underscore between all the words. That's our same handle for our TikTok. Um, I'm planning a whole line of <laughs> really interesting content for the TikTok starting this summer, where I'm going to be going full Gallagher and smashing watermelons because why not? Um, so you get like comic updates and art, but you also get me like destroying fruit with a sledgehammer because I think it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, we're on TikTok. I'm sorry, we're on Twitter. So mm -hmm. at Path Pale Writer. Um, I have a website with a store. So if we're not campaigning, you're, there's no Kickstarter or Indiegogo or any other platform that we choose. If it's not running, you can get all of the books that are available on the website. Um, www.pathofthepalewriter.com. It's pretty simple. Path yeah. of the Pale Rider will get you to us. You can find um, it somewhere, somehow. <laughs> yeah. And then I host a, uh, a, a show. Uh, it's like, uh, pod, I don't know if we would call it a podcast. It's not like Spotify. It's it's like YouTube and Facebook Live. And gotcha. um, I think it streams to Twitter as well. We use StreamYard. Um, but it's called the Tuesday Morning Brew. I'm on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for a couple hours. And I interview other creators like, like we are right now. Um, yep. so we hang out and we talk about all the cool things that are happening in indie comics and, uh, cool. I'm on the comic related madness network. Nice. So uh, I'm everywhere, all over, everywhere. I, you can... <laughs> if you type my name into YouTube, I'll pop up everywhere. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Take over, take over the world. It's, it is what it is. It's good to be visible. Yeah. How can people enjoy it? Like, I know people love this. I get overwhelmingly positive reaction. But if you don't know why I exist, how do you find me? Right. You know what I mean? So yep. that's 50% of the bet. No, I would say it's like 75% of the battle. It's, it's just like, eyes on. here I am. Yep. Here's what I do. You know, come along, you belong. Yeah, that's so cool. Well, Lloyd, thank you just so much for taking some time to talk about, you know, comics and everything that you got going on with this series because it was a lot of fun just getting to hear about the unique ideas that you're bringing to um you know to the indie comic game yeah so. you know, we're having fun it's like it's all fun you know what i mean the reason why we're doing it is because it's a good time yeah so um and that's one of the nice things about the the project is the kickstarters the crowdfunding the indiegogos they go towards funding the comic I, I do all the riddles and the short films for free. Um, so it's not like we have to unlock a certain dollar amount or have a certain number yeah. of backers. They're guaranteed part, you know, there as participation for anybody who wants to participate. So it's just, you know, it's fun. We're having a good time. Let's have a good time together. Absolutely. So again, go check it out again. Uh, go check out the Indiegogo. If you are watching this after that's done, go to the website. Again, links will be in the description of the video or podcast go check it out see it see if you want to get involved in this world and again Lori, thank you so much for talking comics with me and Absolutely. uh gang hopefully you can find some time to curl up grab a book and nerd out peace <laughs>